This is the battlefield of Pharsalus in northern Greece. I'm Matthew Settle. On August 9th, 48 BC, 70,000 Roman soldiers fought to the death in these fields. But they were not fighting a common enemy of Rome. They were fighting each other. This was civil war. The Battle of Pharsalus would decide whether Julius Caesar or his bitter rival, Pompey the Great, would be master of Rome. Now, with new video game technology, you're about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought and how the battle was won. You get the view the generals wished they'd had. Now, a decisive battle. In 48 BC, Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great were the most powerful men in the Roman Empire. Pompey had been married to Caesar's daughter, Julia, but she had died while giving birth. And a few years earlier, Caesar, Pompey, and the immensely rich Crassus had together ruled the entire Roman Empire. Each man had tried to strengthen his position in Rome by winning new lands for the empire. But things began to go wrong in 53 BC when Crassus invaded the eastern kingdom of Parthia. He wanted to be seen as the new Alexander the Great, but he never returned. The Parthians destroyed him. He lost his army, his son, and his own life at the Battle of Cari. Meanwhile, Caesar, a brilliant general, had been winning victory after victory in Gaul, modern-day France. He made a fortune by selling hundreds of thousands of prisoners into slavery. He had charisma. He had the ability to make himself admired by men and loved by women. And he had a burning desire to expand his military reputation. Caesar is someone you either love or hate. Caesar attracts tremendous affection from his men. Uh, he, he has in innovative policies such as uh, saying that he doesn't mind what his soldiers do when they're off duty, as long as they're good in battle. Caesar became rich from the spoils of war and wanted to return and govern Rome. But Pompey was already doing just that. He had been made a consul, one of two men elected each year to govern Rome. The 57-year-old general had also had an impressive military career. He had been tremendously successful in the East, where he had added vast lands to the empire and founded cities and towns before returning to Rome as the people's hero. He had fought in Spain, he fought against Spartacus, but his most outstanding victories were in the East. He was sent off to clear the seas of piracy, and he did it in three months. And that was astonishing to Rome. So that he had, coming back to Rome at the end of the 60s, a reputation as Rome's greatest general. Pompey was the elder statesman, the military elder statesman of the Republic. Pompey was well aware of Caesar's ambition, but Caesar was far away in Gaul, and he didn't consider him an immediate threat. Also, Roman law forbade any general from entering Italy with his army. Pompey appeared to be holding all the cards, but he was still worried. Caesar's popularity was growing daily with tales of his extraordinary victories across Gaul. But then he declared he would rather be the first man in a village than the second man in Rome. He wanted to be elected consul, just like Pompey. He was hugely popular with the ordinary people of Rome, organizing feasts and entertainments. He spent freely. His gladiators fought in silver armor, he had it, and he flaunted it. And he was ruthless. When he was 22, Caesar was captured and held hostage by pirates. They released him when he paid a ransom, and Caesar immediately set off after the pirates. When he captured them, he crucified them and cut their throats. But he had a strong bond with his legions. He campaigned for his veterans to be given farmland when they retired, and addressed all of his soldiers as comrades. 
But Caesar wins not just loyalty, not just respect, but love from his men. And that, I think, is, in the end, what tips the balance between him and Pompey. Now covered in victory honors, Caesar decided to go for broke. He marched his legions down through Gaul to the Italian border marked by the River Rubicon. The boundary of Italy, beyond which you were not supposed to bring your armies because of the danger of civil strife and so on, uh, was a small river, the Rubicon River, in northern Italy. On 11th January 49 BC, he crossed the Rubicon and entered Italy with his army. He had broken Roman law. There was no turning back. That was an act of treason. It's as simple as that. A few days later, Pompey fled Rome and prepared for civil war. Caesar marched down through Italy, defeating all who tried to stop him. His soldiers had come through the wars in Gaul and were at the peak of fighting fitness. Pompey gathered his legions at Brindisi, put them on ships and sailed for Macedonia. The east was where he had made his name. There he could count on help and support. Caesar had no fleet, and it was more than a year later before he could follow with an army and face Pompey at Pharsalus. The stakes could not have been higher. The winner would control the whole Roman Empire. It is 49 BC, and Rome's two greatest generals, Caesar and Pompey, are fighting a civil war for control of the empire. Caesar had 22,000 legionaries against Pompey's 45,000. He was outnumbered two to one, but his troops were battle-hardened. They were veterans who had fought in Gaul. Pompey had placed his troops on high ground overlooking the sea so that he could bring in supplies. Caesar was constantly having to find ways of feeding his army. Most of the surrounding countryside was loyal to Pompey. Warfare at this period was dominated by two main imperatives. First of all, don't lose in battle. And secondly, don't let your army be starved into surrender. Pompey set up his camp by those trees on that distant hill, where he could see Caesar's tents here, about three miles away. Pompey wanted to win, but he did not want to fight. He felt that Caesar's troops were tired, they were hungry, they were malnourished, that eventually he could win without a fixed battle. As one army broke camp, the other would follow and shadow it. It was now summer and Caesar could find food more easily. Pompey's advisors urged him to finish Caesar off before he grew stronger. Pompey's men, if they're being held back, will start to think, what's wrong with us? Why aren't we the equal of these people whom we outnumber? What's wrong with our general if he won't trust us to fight? So in the end, Pompey is convinced by these arguments. On 9th August in 48 BC, Pompey's troops moved down from the high ground and drew up in battle order on the flat plain at Pharsalus. Both Caesar and Pompey had 11 legions. But Caesar's legions totaled only 22,000 men, supported by 1,000 cavalry. He was outnumbered by Pompey, who had 11 full-strength legions totaling 45,000 men and 7,000 cavalry. A 
Roman legion contained roughly 4,000 men. This was divided into 10 cohorts. The cohorts were in turn divided into six centuries, each containing 80 men. Each century was led by a centurion, the key soldier on the Roman battlefield. Caesar knew all of his centurions by name. The centurions in the Roman army were in a unique position. They were the backbone of the army. The centurions were trained and were picked for men who would stand their ground no matter what. Each man carried a three-quarter length curved shield with a brass boss at its center. A pilum or spear and the Roman stabbing sword, the gladius. Helmets with cheek pieces gave good protection. Roman legions were backed up by auxiliary troops. These were from tribes that had been conquered by Rome. They served for 25 years, and the reward, if they survived, was to be made a citizen of Rome. The auxiliaries included archers from Syria, cavalry recruited from tribes with a good tradition of horsemanship. There was great pride within the legions. This was the fighting machine which had made Rome a world power. But now instead of battling against barbarians on the fringes of the empire, these soldiers would be fighting each other. This meant that in the heat of the battle, it was difficult to identify the enemy. Everyone was dressed the same. So each side devised passwords that would enable them to identify friend from foe. Pompey's men had Hercules the Unconquered, while Caesar's side had Venus the bringer of victory. Caesar led from the right wing, with Mark Antony, the officer and friend he trusted most, commanding the left. Both armies were drawn up in the traditional three lines, with the most experienced troops in the third line. Pompey had 45,000 infantry to Caesar's 22,000. But his big advantage lay in his 7,000 cavalry, which outnumbered Caesar's seven to one. Caesar saw the threat from the enemy cavalry and removed a cohort from each legion to form a fourth line which he placed behind his own cavalry as an extra line of defense. Pompey's troops made no attempt to advance, so Caesar ordered his legions forward. At that moment, Pompey's cavalry charged Caesar's cavalry, driving them back in disarray. battlefield was covered in whirling dust. Archers and slingers ran in behind the cavalry and began to pelt Caesar's flank. The stones and arrows rained in. Caesar had been taken by surprise. The Battle of Pharsalus was on and the winner would rule the Roman Empire. It is 49 BC. Rome's two greatest generals, Caesar and Pompey, fighting for supremacy. Caesar rallied his troops after the shock of the all-out cavalry charge. This was truly a civil war. Pompey's cavalry had been led by Caesar's old companion, Labianus. He had fought side by side with Caesar in Gaul, but had now gone over to Pompey. Labianus' disloyalty was reflected in Caesar's own history of these events. Most nights, Caesar would dictate page after page to a scribe in his tent, or on the move as he traveled with his army. In Caesar's history of the war in Gaul, Labienus is a brave and loyal commander. But in the Civil War, he is portrayed as a savage and brutal opponent. But having broken through Caesar's line, Labienus was in trouble. He could not reform his cavalry, and the left wing of Pompey's army, which had followed his charge, was milling around in confusion. 
Caesar sent in his fourth line against the horses. He ordered them to hold their pila upright and jab at horses and riders, like the spears in a phalanx. Caesar told them to leap up, not to throw their spears, but to take their spears and push them up at the faces of these horsemen. Ancient cavalry, indeed cavalry at most eras, don't do well against prepared heavy infantry. Pompeian cavalry were not expecting to run head-on into a well-disciplined line of Roman legionaries. 3,000 men, all with eight-foot spears, were just too much for the riders. Hundreds fell, and the remainder fled into the hills. Caesar tells his men in the fighting line that even though they're outnumbered by the enemy legionaries, they can prevail because they're Caesar's men. And they do. Caesar was an extraordinary leader of men. He had spent year after year after year with his troops in Gaul. He knew the names of his centurions. He lived with his men. He slept in the tents with his men. And his men were willing to fight and die for him. Caesar now took control of the battle. He ordered his men to charge at the enemy. For 200 yards, they ran. A hail of arrows rained down on helmets and shields. But even when they got to within 30 yards, Pompey's men still refused to advance. He told his troops not to charge. The argument was that if you don't charge, Caesar's troops got to charge twice the distance, and they're going to be tired out when they get here. Caesar's centurions called a halt, gave their men a breather, and tidied up the ranks. But then they advanced through their pila. Pompey's army returned the volleys. Javelins flew from both armies at point-blank range. Both ranks collided, but they were evenly matched. Pompey's line held. It was a battle like no other, with opponents asking one another to get news of their fate back to their family. Caesar's fourth line could not make any headway against Pompey's weakened left wing. But then he ordered in his third line, which contained his most battle-hardened troops. Pompey's left wing broke completely, and standing in the center of his army, he saw his remaining legionaries turn and run. Pompey lost the will to fight and fled in panic back to his camp. Caesar had won the day. What the civil war between them reveals is that Caesar is actually the better general and that his success in Gaul had not been a flash in the pan. It was an instance of someone who has a tremendously flexible grasp of generalship and can inspire his men even more than Pompey did. In his own written accounts, Caesar claimed he killed 15,000 of Pompey's men, lost only 200 dead, and captured nine of the coveted eagles. But this was, after all, history written by the winner. The Greek historian, Plutarch, calculated Pompey's casualties at 6,000. Pompey is described in most of the historical sources as being totally shattered by this and crazed almost by this defeat. He withdraws to his tent, he leaves his soldiers on the battlefield, he flees. Pompey and his wife fled to the coast of Greece and sailed to Egypt. Caesar pursued, but the two rivals would never meet again. One of Pompey's own centurions murdered him as he stepped ashore near Alexandria. Caesar arrived three days later and was given Pompey's head in a sack, but he refused to look at it and ordered that Pompey be buried with full honors. 
He wanted to heal the wounds of civil war and showed mercy to many of Pompey's lieutenants, including Marcus Brutus, whose mother had been Caesar's lover. Caesar wanted them to join him, and he sends tribunes in to tell the blokes, you know, you're Romans, we're Romans. Caesar would stay for a while in Egypt and had a child by the young queen, Cleopatra. The civil war was over. He now had supreme power in Rome. His victory marked the end of the old Roman Republic. After returning to Rome, he became dictator. He even had a month of the year named after him, Julius, July. From now on, the men who ruled Rome would be emperors with absolute power, claiming divine authority from the gods. Four years later in 44 BC, Caesar was stabbed to death by conspirators who feared he had amassed too much power. One of them was Marcus Brutus, whose life he had spared in Pharsalus. Bleeding from many wounds, Caesar fell dead at the feet of a statue, the statue of his greatest rival, Pompey the Great.